consider the Gospel of John chapter number 21. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. And this is going to be intentionally from the original King James Version. After these things, now this is after the resurrection, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Just a mental note, no man can experience Jesus the Christ without divine revelation. Before we come to know Christ, experience Christ, be intimate with him, he must reveal himself to us. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee. Do we know who those boys are? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. So a note, a man without vision, a man without insight from God will always return to his past. Now, this, this man Peter, remember, he denied knowing the Lord Jesus Christ suffered tremendous mental anguish over this denial. Now he's in a place where Jesus is resurrected. Jesus is showing himself to his followers. And Peter says, I go a fishing. Remember, wherever you're going, somebody is following you. You're leading people either towards the Christ or away from Christ. So Peter says, now I go fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Everybody say, out of position. They experienced no results, verse 4, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, do you have any results? Have you been fruitful? Have you been productive? Do you have any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. In other words, get in position. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John the beloved, the disciple who leaned upon the breast of the Lord Jesus Christ, he saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Why did they not know this? Now Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now I've shared with our church that uh, I've watched my husband. He enjoys fishing, but he has never gone fishing and turned up naked. My son, our lead pastor, enjoys fishing, but I have never ever seen him go fishing and get naked. So I wonder, in some of your translations, it may say that he was stripped of his fisherman's garment, but the original authorized King James Version does say that he was naked, and he had to have been because the scripture says, and he did cast himself into the sea. So now when we present ourselves to people, particularly people in authority, we want to be presentable. Was he on his way to the shore to greet the Lord? Was he ashamed that he was naked? What was going on in the mind of Peter as he is found naked? This is lesson number three. We're talking out of a continuing series entitled, Why Are You Naked? Many of us, when we just hear the word naked, we immediately go to the, um, the anatomy of the human body. And we surmise that now we're talking about just the outer exterior. But could it be that we are actually addressing a level of nakedness that transcends the human anatomy? It's a level of nakedness that exposes our spiritual condition. Why? Are you naked? We think of the word naked, it, it means to be stripped, it means to be 
uncovered. It means to be out of position. Now, remember, this is lesson number three, so a lot of this we have already explained. What would you do if someone walked in this room and they're completely naked? Completely naked. You'd have issue with it, particularly if they sat down right next to you. And the facilitator, the pastor, the minister says absolutely nothing about it, but yet you have a naked individual positioned right next to you. Would you feel uncomfortable? How many of you would feel very uncomfortable? Uh, how many of you would get up and move? All right, something's wrong with the rest of y'all because <laughs> anytime I'm in, listen, if I'm in a room and someone walks in naked, I will make sure I find the nearest exit. I will not sit next to a naked person. I know something's up with this. Mentally, you don't have it all together. And is this the norm for this particular entity? Because nobody seems to have an issue with it. Why are you naked? We're going to go to Genesis in just a little bit, and I want to show you that when we are naked from God's perspective, it means that we have been stripped of the presence of God. We are stripped of the glory of God. We are absent, detached from the very essence of God's nature. And when we are stripped of the glory of God, there are some things that we seek to do. We seek to disguise our nakedness. That is, we wear the apparel of the culture. So I am more in tune with the culture. I, I adapt to the ways of the culture when I am stripped of the presence of God, the glory of God, the power of God. When there's a disconnect between me and heaven, I disguise my nakedness. And so I identify more with the culture. When I'm stripped of the glory of God, I flaunt my nakedness. In other words, I am saturated with the ways of the culture. So I have no issue with drinking. I have no issue with getting high. I have no issue with being at the hookah bar. I, I have no issue with bar hopping. I, I have no issue with smoking weed. I, I have no issue with fornicating, shacking, common law. I have no issue with sin. I flaunt my nakedness when I'm stripped of the glory of God. When I'm stripped of the glory of God, I seek to cover my nakedness. That is, fill my life up with the perverted. And we must understand this. We'll see this in one of our key statements in just a little bit, that whenever passion is misdirected, when passion is not directed by God, when passion is detached from purpose, it always leads to perversion. Genesis chapter number 2, we're looking at verses 21 through 25. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep, to fall upon the man Adam. Now remember, God has created in Genesis 1 the spirit of mankind. And he says, the triune Godhead, let us make man the species of mankind in our image and after our likeness. We're going to give them dominion over the works of our hands. And so God creates spirit in Genesis chapter number 2. Now God creates the, the container, the dirt pot the house, and he, he breathes into this dirt pot, the breath of life. Man becomes a living soul. But God is, is not finished because now Adam has been given an assignment to name all of the creatures on the face of the earth. But there is not a helper suitable and adaptable for him. And so God puts this man, Adam. Now remember, Adam has within his loins every person who would ever walk the face of planet earth. And he slept. So God... He took one of his ribs, one of the ribs out of Adam, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he another man. Are y'all reading the Bible? I know I'm real cute, but you're not looking at me. You're looking at the book, right? God has made him a womb man. Not a seed carrier, but he has fashioned a female that is man with a womb and brought her, not him, unto Adam. Is that clear in the scripture? So did you don't think that I'm giving you my opinion. Can we just go to school just for a little bit here? And you all treat me just like you treat the lead pastor. You know what that means. Verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Notice, 
Adam named her, Adam called her, not God. God had already given Adam the assignment to name all of the creatures. So when this woo man is presented to the man Adam, it is Adam who calls her womb man. He identifies very quickly that this is not a seed carrier. Ooh, we y'all gonna make me work today. This is not a male. Because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, the seed carrier, the male man, the ish in the Hebrew, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, woo man, can y'all see it in the book? And they shall be one flesh, cleave to her. She is Isha. Verse 25, and they were both Notice, naked, the man and his wife. <laughs> not his mistress, not his girlfriend, not his business partner, not the one he's living with. Can y'all understand it? Not the one he's shacking with, not common law. But this is his wife. They have entered into holy matrimony. It is the institution that God created for the family. They were both naked. What does that mean? And the man and his wife and were not ashamed. Husband and wife, naked. Hebrew word, arom, it means that they were transparent. The man and his wife, and this is the way the relationship should be. When we're in a marital context, understand, we should be pure within that marital context. We should be innocent within that marital context without sin. And it is possible for a man, a male man, to take a wife, female man, man with a womb, and live in a way wherein there is no sin that pollutes that union. It is possible. Otherwise, God would not have this as a requirement for us, that marriage is honorable in all things and do not defile the bed. Oh, that's another teaching, right? Without sin, naked, they were vulnerable. Relationships require vulnerability. Yes, I'm open, I'm honest, I am covered by the glory of God. They had a union with God, Adam and Eve. Naked, their bodies physically naked, but because they were saturated with the glory of God, covered with the glory of God, endowed with the glory of God, their physical anatomy was not the issue. The Greek word for ashamed is bush. So the initial state of the male and the female, the absence of embarrassment, the absence of disgrace, the absence of any guilt or any shame, they were covered by God's presence, his holiness, his glory. This is the way God created marriage. It's the way it should look. Before we further investigate our subject, let's consider the spiritual climate of the day. Can we talk, saints? A climate that opposes, I'm talking the climate of the day, from God's perspective, a climate that opposes holiness, a climate that celebrates evil, a climate that is resistant to the truth of God's word. This message is not for the sinner. It is for the professed followers of Christ. It is for the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the whole company of the redeemed, that community of believers. This message is for those who profess to be members of the family of God and for those who seek to be followers of Christ. I'm not addressing those who have a love for darkness. I'm not addressing those who choose to reject Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. The church is that organism mandated by God to bring the light of Christ to the culture, not to be shaped by or fashioned by the culture. The church brings light and life and salt to the culture. And today, I just want to talk to those who profess to be in the church. John 3, 16 through 21. For this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved the cosmos in the Greek, the sum total of inhabitants 
upon the face of the earth, past, present, and future. This is how God loved the cosmos, not the political order, not the social order, but this is how God loved people. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, that is Jesus the Christ, not Buddha and not Muhammad and not all of these other cults or religions, Christianity is a way of life founded upon the person of Jesus Christ, so that everyone who believes in him, Jesus the Christ, will not perish, pay attention, but have eternal life. That's what God set us up for. God sent his son, that's Jesus, into the world, the cosmos now, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him, that is through the Christ. There is no judgment, pay attention, against anyone who believes in him, believes in Jesus the Christ as the son of the living God. So understand that truth, when it is accepted, must become visible. And when I say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, I have rearranged my entire life to accommodate the teachings of Christ. So to simply say that I mentally assent or I mentally acknowledge, yeah, he's Jesus, he's the son of God. But if I have not rearranged my entire life to accommodate the teachings of Christ, I have not accepted Christ. Truth accepted must become visible. But anyone who does not believe in him that is in Jesus Christ, pay attention, has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment, the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world in the person of his son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus said, I come in the volume of the book, for it is written of me to do your will, thy will, Father. But people, notice this, the scripture says, but people, there's not anybody in here because I'm talking to the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the followers of Christ. There's not anybody in here. But the Bible says that people loved the darkness more than the light. Can you see it? And how do we know this? You'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears, for their actions were evil. Their actions were evil. Verse 20, and who, all who do evil, pay attention, hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Now listen, when you are walking with God, when, when, when you are a reflection of the light, when you have accepted truth and it's visible and when you've rearranged your life to accommodate the teachings of Christ, listen, those who walk in darkness really don't want to be around you. They don't want to have anything to do with you, you see, because you have two separate and distinct masters and your life will bring conviction to them. They don't want to be around light because light will expose darkness. So understand this, if you are rolling with folk, running with folk, and they are saturated with evil, saturated with darkness, and they're comfortable in your presence and you're comfortable in their presence, you're probably detached from God. Because when you walk with God, you're going to bring conviction to the lives of those who do not walk with God. It's right here in the scripture. Verse 20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear. Listen, why? Their sins will be exposed. Don't get up and walk out now. But those who do what is right, come, pay attention, come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Are we doing what God wants? Point of emphasis, Jesus Christ died for the sinner, not a system. Listen, not a social order, not a political order, not a financial system, educational system. Jesus the Christ died for the sinner, not a system. This is important because we cannot legislate holiness. We cannot legislate righteousness. We cannot legislate moral excellence, you see. So I don't look to the government, listen, to invoke upon people any particular law or stipulation that would encourage righteousness or holiness. The government is corrupt. But I do look to God. So it doesn't matter if the government says that it's okay have an abortion. Listen, that is not where I get my information, my insight, my instructions. When I walk with God, I get my instructions from the book, from the mind of God. Those who choose darkness will not understand this message. 
nor will they be receptive to a message of this magnitude. That really doesn't matter to me. I understand this. We cannot idolize evil, celebrate evil, and imitate Christ at the same time. And so if I'm idolizing evil, I'm celebrating evil, right? I have no problem with evil, then all things being equal, I'm probably not in the kingdom of God. Because I cannot imitate evil or celebrate evil or idolize evil and imitate Christ. It is not possible. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, let's prove it from the scripture. But people who aren't, they're not born again. They're, they're not spiritual people. They don't know God. They can't receive the truths from the Spirit. So I don't, I, listen, I don't waste time arguing with people who want to justify a lifestyle that, that opposes God. Why would I, I understand that the natural man, the person who's not born again, the person who is not spiritual, cannot receive the truths from God's Spirit? Yes, it does. It all sounds foolish to them. It doesn't take all of that. You all are on the, uh, the extreme side of it. You know, I can live the way I want to live, and then grace is going to abound, so I can pretty much do what I want to do. Ask God to forgive me. Everything's going to be okay. It all sounds foolish to them. Pay attention, and they can't understand it. Why? For only those who are spiritual, those who are hooked up to the source of life, empowered by the source of life, rooted and grounded in the source of life. Those of us who are connected to the Christ, we understand it because we are spiritual beings. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Number one, we recognize in here today, there's the natural man. The natural man, that's, that's the person who's not born again, not saved, not connected to the Christ, Stripped naked of the glory of God, detached from God. These are folk that we want to reach, we want to minister to, but the natural man does not know God. So whatever I say today is going to anger the natural man. It's going to upset the natural man. He's going to have issue with whatever I say. That's going to be pushed back because he's not even born again. Number two, there's the carnal man in this house today. This is the person who's ruled by the flesh. I opened up my heart to Jesus. But you know, I'm still under construction. I still want to do some of those things that please the flesh. I have not caved in to holiness. I've not caved in to righteousness. Yeah, born again, go to church, but still ruled by the flesh. And then there's the spiritual person, the spiritual man. That's the person who is submitted to and, and led by the Spirit of God. This is the person that is moving on to that place of maturity. This is that person who's really serious about God. They ain't playing church. Right? They're not holy on Sunday and unholy on Monday. This is the person who's going to hold a steady course. Understand, I make no attempt to try to convince a culture or a person who does not know God to understand spiritual matters. Why is that? The human mind cannot comprehend Christ. The human mind cannot wrap the thought around the reality of Christ, the Son of the living God, and his expectations of us. Our key statement, for any relationship to be successful, there must be values, boundaries, there must be a standard. Any relationship, whether we're talking ministry, we're talking marriage, we're talking parenting, when we talk about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, for any relationship to be successful, there must be values. God gives us a value system to live by. There must be boundaries. There must be guidelines. And there must be the standard, the code of conduct. This is the principle by which we live. As followers of Christ, there can be no doubt. Are you all listening or did you jump up and leave and go home? You know your body can be here, but you jumped up and left and went home. You know that, right? As followers of Christ, there can be no doubt that we live a life of boundaries. Everybody say boundaries. boundaries. Sure, and it is a life of sacrifice. It is a life of discomfort. It is a life reflecting the highest moral and spiritual character. Man's highest achievement Please hear me. It's not educational. It is not our financial portfolio. The highest achievement to conform to the moral and the spiritual character of Christ, that's the goal. That's the highest achievement. Can we do it? 
to conform to the moral and the spiritual character of Christ is the goal. And that is the highest achievement. This is what God expects of us. God does not have unrealistic expectations of his creation. Whatever or whoever we allow to define us will dictate our behavior. So if I extract my identity from the culture, then the culture defines me. The culture dictates my behavior. If I extract my identity from Beyonce or from Drake or from P. Diddy or from, what is that, Kanye West or, or all of these rappers and these entertainers and, and the artists that you refuse to throw away their music, you're yet grooving to their music. If I extract my identity from these secular entertainers and artists, they dictate my behavior. They define my identity. Oh, this is really good. I'm having fun. So listen, got time? Listen, I'm not teaching Resurrection Sunday, so while I got you in here, I'm going to keep you. Don't try, listen, don't try to go anywhere. Point of emphasis, how can we? This is where I'm passionate. God's growing our church how can we make disciples if those who say they follow Christ refuse to obey the instructions? Obey the instructions of Christ. We can go into a courtroom. I don't know how many of you all have experienced a jury summons or served on a, on a, on a jury. You, you understand when we go in the court, they won't allow us to eat up in there. And we don't start, listen, we don't, we don't start having tantrums. Yeah, we can't be on the cell phone in there. Right? We can't be talking loud. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Somebody's helping me preach. No, no there, there is an attire that we wear. Listen, we, we can't behave any kind of way, and it is a court of law and order, and we follow the rules and the regulations, and we don't have issue with it. We do what we're told to do, but when we come to church, it is the only organism, and the church is an organism, not, not an organization. It's the only organism where we come in and we get upset when we find that there are rules and regulations. Because why? I'm supposed to be able to do whatever I want to do. Surely this is God's house, right? But God has something to say about behavior in his house. How can we make disciples of those who say they follow Christ, refuse to obey the instructions of Christ, the values, the boundaries, the standard governing the relationship? How does that happen? While the body of Christ seeks to make disciples, the devil is making his disciples. Did you know it? And the challenge is to get the church, the ecclesia, to see through the lens of Scripture, to see from God's perspective. We will never relate to God's perspective of us if we do not know God's perspective of us. And that's why we must be found teaching ever teaching so that you can see God's perspective and we can adapt to his perspective, we can see from his perspective. You see, he has given us a more sure word of prophecy. So the Bible does reveal to us prophetic authority. It is the highest governing authority in the earth, whether we recognize it or not. This is what God has given us to teach in his church. And listen, if we cannot honor this, if we cannot obey this, if we cannot respect this, why do we think that God has any other word outside of this word? Why is it that we lust for people to call us out and speak what we call a prophetic word over us when we won't do this? And this is the highest prophetic authority. While we seek to train God's people in the ways of righteousness, Satan and his emissaries are training their followers in the way of evil. So let's identify where we are. We've got godly disciples trained in the ways of righteousness. And then we have those satanic disciples trained in the ways of evil. We cannot, if you're in the body of Christ, understand this. We can never be too timid to speak the truth. And may I remind us, the church, those who profess to love God, who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot stroll with the devil and walk with God. It is not possible. To walk with God requires discipline of, of us. It does require intentional effort. It requires sacrifice. It does require discomfort. 1 John 1, 6. Can't walk with God and stroll with the devil. If we say we have fellowship with him, that's with Jesus Christ. 
while we pay attention, walk in darkness. That is, commit to a lifestyle of darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. Pay attention because we're in one kingdom or the other. I'm in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. I cannot be in both. I'm following Christ or I'm following the devil. I cannot follow both. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we practice darkness, we're telling a lie. And we do not practice the truth. I didn't say it. God said it. So we, the ecclesia, we've been chosen by God after hearing the gospel to represent God. Everybody say this. I have been chosen by God. To represent God. You see, after I've heard the gospel, that is, that I, I've made a decision to honor and obey the gospel message, I've made that commitment. Now it's my time to represent God. Ephesians 2.10. This is supposed to be traditionally Palm Sunday, taking us up to Resurrection Sunday. So I'm going to work this palm while I'm up here, okay? <laughs> yeah. Ephesians 2.10. The Amplified... For we are his workmanship. Now, I belong to God because I've accepted the gospel, the good news. His own masterwork. A work of art, you see. And it is important how I see myself. I see myself as a masterpiece, as a masterwork, as a work of art created in Christ Jesus. Reborn from above. I'm the offspring of God. I'm connected to him. Rooted and grounded in him. I'm born from above. Notice the scripture says, spiritually transformed. It is a metamorphosis now. A shedding away of the old so now I can put on this new man in Christ Jesus. Spiritually transformed, renewed, pay attention, ready to be used. That's God's objective. He wants me to know something so that I can believe something so that I can become something, so that I can do something. Ultimately, God wants to use me as a conduit, as a channel, as a vessel fit for the master's good use to represent the kingdom. Notice, he says, to be used for good works, which God prepared, it's called predestination, for us beforehand, taking paths which he set. You see, God does order our steps and he does establish our goings. He does lead us in the way that he wants us to go so that we would walk in them living, notice, the good life. God wants us to live a good life. Can you believe it? It's all throughout the scripture, particularly in John 10, 10, when the Bible says it's the thief, the devil, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. That's the Zoe life, the life of God, life by the highest order. I've come that you might have life, and that more abundantly. He did not create us to die. He created us to live. How, how did death even enter into the equation? When Adam and Eve made a decision to go against God, they experienced what is called spiritual death, separated from God. They set in motion physical death, spirit separated from the body. They set in motion this death of the soul. Now I'm disoriented. And I don't think the thoughts of God. I'm thinking now the thoughts of Satan because he was the one whispering in my ear. Pay attention to who's whispering in your ear. Who is counseling you? Who's giving you instruction? Who is informing you? Your decisions are shaped by whoever is whispering in your ear. It's important. Can y'all see it in the scripture? We're living this good life which he prearranged. He made this good life ready for us. There is nothing we can preach more powerful than the gospel. Can I take my time? Some of y'all say, oh, please hurry up, please hurry up and finish. <laughs> Nothing we can preach, listen, that is more powerful than the gospel. Nothing can make the gospel more powerful than it is. Nothing transforms the human life like the gospel. Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek, the gospel, when the human heart, you got to listen to this, when the human heart is receptive and the power of the gospel is preached, the presence of the Holy Spirit permeates, infiltrates the human heart so that transformation occurs. Can I repeat it? I was going to do it anyway because y'all ain't saying nothing. When the human heart is receptive, 
and the power of the gospel is preached, the presence of the Holy Spirit permeates and infiltrates the human heart so that transformation occurs. And so what is the gospel? I'll tell you what it is, and we're going to read it, right? This is the gospel message. It doesn't take us long to preach it. We believe that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he got up out of the grave. He led captivity captive as he ascended into heaven. He's seated on the right-hand side of the Almighty God. There he ever lives to make intercession for us, and he's coming back again for his church, a church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. That is the gospel message, and that's what the church needs to preach. Not new age, not humanism, not philosophies of men, not ideologies, you all understand this. Not reading you some poem from some book, not plagiarizing from something that somebody else taught and they don't know what they're talking about. It is the gospel message that must be preached because it is the gospel that delivers. Let's read it from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, you just heard the gospel. That's what needs to be preached in our churches. It's Jesus Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand by which also you are saved. How are we saved? By the gospel message. It is our receptivity to the gospel. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you. Can y'all see this? Verse 3. For I delivered to you first all of all that which I received. I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. Can you see it? And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. Without the gospel, we are naked, we are impotent. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit says to us. If we strip away, consider if we strip away all of our fundraisers, all of our concerts, all of the activities of the local church, all of the programs for the marrieds and for the unmarrieds and the seniors, the youth, the children, and I'm not saying that these are not good endeavors. What do we have left after we have stripped all of these things away from the church? I'm asking the question. What could we offer in our local churches that's more powerful than the gospel? And yet instead of preaching the pure, undiluted, uncompromised word of God, we have preached messages that satisfy the appetites of the people. We have produced spiritual doors and junk food junkies. We have replaced the gospel for gimmicks, the games, the craziness of the culture, and all forms of corruption. There's the thing about the gimmicks, you know, after we have presented gimmick after gimmick after gimmick, you see, because people are, are, are fickle and, and in a hurry to pounce on the, the next fad, the next big thing, the, the gimmicks become more freaky. Because you got to keep the people coming, right? Whatever you use, pay attention and hear the Spirit of God. Whatever gimmick, whatever game you use, the subliminal brainwashing, all the junk and the trash that we use, to bring people into the house. We have to continue down that path. We have to continue in that vein. You see, we've got to keep uh, 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 highlighting these gimmicks because we got to keep the people coming. And so the gimmicks have to become more freaky because people soon tire of the same old, same old. So we have to give them a new fad, right? Got to be something else real catchy. You notice it with fashion. You see the, the fashion changing. What do we do? We change with the fashion, right? Ooh, y'all real quick. Cool. Don't you start messing with my clothes. Listen, we change <laughs> with the fashion, right? Now understand, the church must be filled with the gospel, not the gimmicks. And so Jesus had an issue with this production of all of these spiritual dwarfs and junk food junkies. You see, because we are giving people junk, not the gospel. And then we expect spiritually mature people, and they cannot mature on the stuff that they're being fed. Matthew 21, verses 12 through 16. 
Then Jesus, now remember Palm Sunday, Jesus, he's going into the temple. Where is he going? He's going into the church, the synagogue, the temple, the place of worship. He goes in and he drives out all those who bought and sold in the temple. They have made a marketplace out of the church. They've made merchandise of, of things in the church. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house, the church. You know the place where we like to bring our coffee and our, our popcorn, you know, our tea, our soda, you know, our smoothies, our Popeye's chicken, you know, our McNuggets. You know, we want to bring that in the church. And nobody don't say nothing about this. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> Sure, we come in, right? We're expecting a motivational word. We're expecting entertainment. We're expecting amusement. Oh, but certainly not a word from God. Not a word that would challenge my lifestyle. Not a word that would bring me conviction. Not a word that would have me put down my porn and, and put down my bullet and my rose, right? Put, put, put down that hooker, hooker, whatever the hooker. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm not expecting a word, not from God. Because I didn't go in there to hear a word from God. I came in there because I wanted to do my own thing. Amen. But in the temple, and I want you all to understand, the people that Jesus dealt with, these were the priests, the religious leaders. When they were making merchandise of the people, they were exploiting the people and defrauding the people and raping, bleeding, and fleecing the people. They were cheating the people. They were charging them these high prices in the temple, you see. Isn't that what a lot of churches look like? Right? Looks just like the culture. Looks just like the world. There's this fleecing and there's raping and there's bleeding and there's exploiting and there's defrauding. There's taking the unfair advantage of it. And you can't say anything because Deacon got his girlfriend and his wife and the pastor got his girlfriend and his boyfriend. <laughs> and don't look over at the choir members and the musicians because it's something sweet about all of them. <laughs> Some of you all, you wonder why men won't come to church. Why? When they see homosexuals parading throughout the church and the so-called shepherd won't call it out. When they see sisters dressed half naked and, and flirting with married men and the pastor won't call it out. When we can look around in our churches and we can see the corruption and we don't say nothing about it. Why? We got to keep crowds coming. We got to keep money coming. We want to be popular and it has sapped the vitality out of God's church. Why? It has sapped the life out of our Christian witness because anything goes. Well, why come to church? You may as well go to the hookah bar. <laughs> Y'all help me out if I didn't say it right. <laughs> I've been trying to be educated <laughs> by the young people, but I keep messing it up somehow. So Jesus says he, he overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I submit to us that the church should be just what Jesus expected. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Can you all take straight talk? I believe, listen, the prostitute ought to come and get healed. I do believe that. I do believe the gigolos ought to come and be healed and, and those who are strung out on crack cocaine and those who are strung out on, strung out on weed, I believe they ought to come and be healed. I believe a lesbian girl ought to come and hear the gospel and be delivered and a homosexual male, a transgender, an adulterer, and a fornicator, and a liar, and a thief, listen, and a wine bibber. I believe that when the gospel is preached, I believe this with all of my heart that when we return to God and we preach the gospel in his house, 
We will see relationships restored. We'll see our children come back. Listen, we will see husbands love their wives as Christ loves love the church, and wives will respect and honor their husbands, and unmarried folk will live holy lives. And we won't have to talk our young girls, listen, out of getting an abortion when the gospel is preached. I don't care if you don't like me. I didn't come here for likes. You all understand I'm real old school, right? And understand this, I ain't looking for no fans and no followers, no subscriptions. I'm not looking for prestige, no spotlight. I'm not looking for no honorariums. I ain't looking for none of that. I just want to see God face to face. And when I stand before him, I do want him to be able to say, well done. They didn't want to hear it, but you told them anyway. And nobody's blood will be upon me. The Bible says this, thank you. You all got this ice cold. You, you all know when you give a person water when they preach, and you're supposed to give it to them room temperature. <laughs> don't, don't y'all say nothing, because that's my boyfriend. That's my husband. So. <laughs> Somebody find me some room temperature water. He just didn't know any better. Come on, we got to finish this now. Listen, but when, listen, verse 15, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things, we want to see some wonderful things happen in God's house that he did, that Jesus did, and the children crying out in the temple. The children were saying this. There's something sacred about God's house. We need to see it. Hosanna for the son of David, to the son of David. Listen, the religious leaders, right? They were indignant. And said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. I now see, he repented. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, because he does have to go home with me, right? <laughs> now listen, don't you just say, well, she got her water up there. Where's my water? Don't. <laughs> you ain't up here preaching, right? And you all know we're in a spiritual battle. Do you know that when we're preaching, we're in a spiritual battle? Amen. All of our trinity, our spirit, soul, and body is engaged in warfare. Yes. You know why? Because we're fighting for your souls. You all have to hear me. While we're fighting for your souls, you're fighting us. Amen. We're fighting for your life, and you're fighting us. Why? You're resistant to truth. I don't want to stop. I don't want to cave in. I don't want to give it up. But we're fighting for you. It's a spiritual battle. I'm not finished, so y'all just be okay, right? So understand, this is where we are. The one component God gave to save the lost, to transform lives, to build his church and represent him in the earth is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the embodiment of the message, this message of hope, this message of deliverance, and there's no salvation independent of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no healing, there's no deliverance, there's no restoration. Have you heard the statement, to know my creator is to know myself? And then I know his expectations of me. Did they put it on the screen? <laughs> to know my creators, to know myself and his expectations of me. So we've been called out of darkness. I'm almost done. We've been called out of darkness. Therefore, our lives should not be a reflection of darkness. It's Colossians 1, 13 through 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of, of his beloved son. I'm in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, so how could I be a reflection of darkness? In whom we have redemption. Yes, the forgiveness of sins. He forgives us. So now we stop portraying an image we were not created to portray. You see, because we cannot remember, participate in, celebrate and idolize evil and imitate Christ. God requires much of us because he paid much for us. Now, so if we want to attend church for any other reason than to be transformed by the gospel, we are simply, pay attention, a distraction to the ones who are seeking transformation. I want to say it again. If we attend church for any other reason than to be transformed by the gospel, we are simply a distraction to the ones who seek transformation. We are a naked generation. A generation that is wild and unrestrained. Did I get that from the scripture? It's in Proverbs can you look there? It's on the screen. 29, 18. Where there is, this is, listen, no prophetic authority, in other words. 
No revelation from God. No insight from God. No direction from God. In other words, when the gospel is not preached, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. Understand this. They cast off restraint. In other words, in another translation, it says that they are wild and unrestrained because they have no insight from God, no instructions from God. What should the church be doing? Making sure that you receive instructions from God. Blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. So we can't be cynical, skeptic, judgmental, questioning the standard that God gives us to live by. The devil wants us to doubt and to question the authority and authenticity of God's word. So we disobey him. So now you have to be on guard when, when, when folks say, well, you don't just show it to me in the Bible. It's not that you want to see it in the Bible. You want to justify ungodliness, you see. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not the one. I don't, listen, I don't argue scripture with anybody. When a person tries to justify a position of unrighteousness, listen, I back all the way off. All I can do now for you is intercede. Because you want to justify. Listen, this is an unteachable heart. This is a heart that's not willing to change. Now, let's jump into this. Every aspect of God is sacred. Can y'all take me a few more minutes? Every aspect as it pertains to God is sacred. He's a holy God. I want to introduce him to you. We ask the question, why are you naked? Why, why do we ask this type of question? Jesus used this type of method when he was teaching many, rebuking many, instructing many. He would ask questions such as, well, whose image is on the coin? Do you want to be whole? Was John's baptism from God or was it from men? He would ask questions. What is he doing? Asking a question is a profound way by which to teach. Our teaching series, this Why Are You Naked, is presented in the form of a question to provoke thought. Pay attention. It is designed to question, to engage the intellect. It is a question to solicit an answer. It is a question to arouse the interest and, and the curiosity of the individual, a question that must be personalized. It is a question requiring self-examination, a question for the purpose of correction and for the purpose of instruction, a question. For the purpose of encouraging change, transformation, development, we were created by God with the capacity to analyze, to reason, to think. We were created to think. That's why you, you, you cannot be in a place where you continue to be ruled by feelings and emotions. We were created with the ability to think. So, so Jesus presents a question to educate and to expose evil. He walks planet Earth. Now pay attention. We must know that Satan employs the same method, he will present a question to God's children. His strategy is to challenge the validity of what God says. So he seeks to stir up doubt in the minds of people so that we question the integrity of God. His aim is to influence us to disobey God. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Lord have mercy, this is loaded. And the woman said unto the serpent, So you all, you have to stay away from Ouija boards and horoscopes and all of this, this witchcraft and stuff. You just stay away from all of this. Can y'all understand it? You don't need to be talking to the devil. You resist him, you give him no place, we exercise authority over him by our obedience to Christ, but you don't need to be in conversation with nobody who wants to talk to you about necromancy and communicating with the dead. Now, you know my dead auntie, they said she, she got a word from me. She ain't got no word, that's a demon. <laughs> I just, you ain't got to go study nothing. So the woman said to, to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Did God say what he meant? He meant what he said, and the serpent said to oh, nah. That's just like, okay, we teach it. You go and some of your little friends, and you, don't, you ain't got to do all that stuff. The, the lady, the lady off. She and her son, they off. The elders off. The deacons are off. The trustee, you ain't got to listen to that. Now, notice, y'all pay attention to me, okay? Just keep your eye on me, because I'm cool. <laughs> and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doeth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw, so I want you to pay attention, because you'll see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
So when you're studying scripture and the Bible says Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Can you see it? Categories. Can y'all see it? So she saw that the tree was good for food. And y'all be careful because you can't just be eating anything. That's another story. I'm going to leave y'all alone. And, and listen, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Watch what you're looking at. Lust of the eyes and the tree uh, to be desired to make one wise. We're talking about the pride of life. So she took of that fruit thereof and she did eat. And Adam was running through the garden naked while she was eating. What, what was going on? He was right there with her. Now, I know this is just a sidebar. So, you know, the men coming out of a conference, powerful conference, and our aim is to see godly men in position, right? Now, all it took, th this was a godly woman, a perfect woman, right? This was not a sinful woman. It took this one woman to pull a godly man out of position. Pay attention to me. The devil's interest was not in that woman. The devil wanted the man. Y'all have heard it before. Because in Adam all died, and Adam is the seed carrier. Adam carries the nations, the generations. He carries the family, right? He carries the community. He carries the church. He has all of us in his loins. But the devil used one woman to pull a godly man out of position. And I submit to you that as our men aspire to be men, kings in position, the devil will make sure he positions a woman. And his aim is to pull a godly man out of position. It wasn't another man that pulled Adam out of position. It was a woo man. A woo man. Y'all can take straight talk. See, this one didn't have a penis. Oh, no. Here we go. I've got this. This was the opposite. Yeah. So it seems like it works every time, whether it is on Samson or Abraham or whoever the situation. It seems that that little woo man who has a, anyway, pulls him out of position every time. <laughs> My grandbaby said, oh, Gigi said penis in the pulpit. <laughs> Y'all ought to be glad. I'm really being nice only because I'm running out of time. That's something nice. <laughs> so now she gave, he was right there. So to the brothers, remember, you're right there. Listen, you're held accountable to God as to what's going on in your house. Yo, listen, your wife ought not, I said your wife, <laughs> your wife ought not be talking to the devil and then informing you. Y'all missed that part. Genesis 3, 7, why are you naked? And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked. What? And they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. What happened to them? God said they truly died. So they didn't drop dead physically, but spiritually. Now they're alienated and shut off from the life of God. They are spiritually dead. Can y'all see it? Now, they're aware of their naked bodies because they are stripped of the glory of God. Why are you naked? See, I submit to us that much of our behavior is proportional to our spiritual nakedness. See, I talk like this, dress like this, smoke this, drink this, go over there, sleep with him, sleep with her. Why? It's proportional to my spiritual nakedness. Ooh, I know I got the right word. Don't worry, I won't be preaching next Sunday, so you don't have to worry about it, right? <laughs> See, I don't have time for Genesis uh, 3.20. I want you all to notice, they tried to cover themselves up. So, so here we are now, because we've been stripped naked now, nothing is sacred. Can I talk just a few minutes and we can go, we're going to go home? Nothing is sacred anymore. Our marriages are not sacred. The church is not sacred, you see. When I marry, listen, adultery is never considered an option. I get one when I get married. Do you understand it? When I'm unmarried, I get none. And the church, come on, the church, say, hey, <laughs> oh, yeah, when you're unmarried, you get none. So, I, I, I don't be liking on her. You don't have to, right? You can't hate on me either because then you'd be hating God. There's no reverence. Everything to God is sacred. 
how do we come out of this, Pastor? How do we, how do we get to a place where in, we're no longer stripped of the glory of God and the presence of God? Just one word when it comes to the application, the how, I return to Him. I return to Him. I need to know Him personally. I need to know Him as my Savior. Can you all understand this? We cannot be casual in our approach to God. I want to take you down a journey, you see. He is not the man upstairs. He's not my homeboy. He ain't dope. Right? He's God Almighty. You see, we now, we have condescended, listen, to the thinking of the culture. And so a God who is very sacred in his person, in his character, in his nature now, we refer to him as the man upstairs. He's my homeboy. You know he's dope. And, 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 and I know we really, we were not intentional when it comes to our disrespect. We didn't know. We need to unlearn some stuff so that we can be taught some things. Why do you bring it to our attention? Because his name, Onoma in the Greek, is the divine representation of his person. His name is incomprehensible, indescribable, inexhaustible. Listen, he's the God, listen, who sits upon the circles of the earth and he spread out heaven like a curtain. He's measured out the waters in the palm of his hand. The earth is his, the fullness there. He's God. He called himself the I am that I am. You know this. The alpha, the omega, the beginning, the ending, the first and the last and before the beginning and after the ending and everything in between. And, and we cannot wrap our minds around the width of him, the depth of him, the breadth of him, the vastness of him. He has called himself. You don't have to understand. His name is sacred. That's why he's not dope. Listen, he is the seed of woman. He is the Passover lamb. He is the root and the offspring of David. He is the bright and he is the morning star. He is the ancient of days. He is the lion out of the tribe of Judah. He is our advocate, the perfect sacrifice. He is our soon coming king. Do you understand that he is the true vine? Yes, he is. He's God. Stand to your feet. He's God. No, he ain't dope. No, he ain't my homeboy. Listen, he's not the man upstairs. He's God Almighty. All by himself, he's God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He is Elohim God. He holds our breath in the palm of his hand. He can look at us and we live. He can look at us and we die. Understand he is God. Why are we naked? We have abandoned God. We turned our backs on him. And he wants us to return to him. Application? Give me some hope. How do I get out of it? I return to him and I fall in love with him and I choose him more than the pleasures of sin. I choose him because he really is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus says, no man can get to the Father unless they go through the Son so we can give up all this other religious stuff. I cannot get to heaven, get to God, unless I go through Jesus Christ. The son of the living God, he is immutable. He's the Lord, he changes not. And he is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. He was great for my generation. He's great for your generation. I don't care how old you are. You all have heard pastors say it. I've lived over half of my life. I won't be here another 66 or 65 years. But while I'm here, we're making disciples. And listen, don't you dare turn a deaf ear to this message because God is calling you to himself. Can you understand it? It's not about raping you, taking money from you. It is elevating the quality of your life. He did come that you might have life and that more abundantly. That's elevated life. But he doesn't take us on our terms. We come on his terms. We don't negotiate with him and tell him what we're going to give up and what we're not going to give up, you see. He wants us 100%. It's like marriage. In a marital relationship, a wife doesn't give 50%. She gives 100 The husband doesn't give 50%. He gives 100 And in our relationship with Christ, he wants all of us. 
He wants a hundred. You know why? He gave us all he had in the person of his son. Are you willing to give your life to him? You see, that's the offering that he wants. More than silver, more than gold, more than money, he wants you to offer up your life to him. Let's make sure church in our hearts is sacred again. Don't get pissed off because somebody told you get rid of your, your coffee or your tea or your smoothie or your chicken. You see, you came to be fed spiritually. You came to be fed spiritually. And if I can abide by the laws, the rules, the regulations of the land, how much more when I enter into this place of worship he told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? But to come together as the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And we can do it with honor. We can do it with a sacredness about us. Can we do it? Yes. Understand, when we are dressed in the glory of God, dressed, marked by the presence of God, nobody has to tell us how to dress. Uh, nobody... Does, nobody has to tell a young woman, you don't need to flirt with that married man. Right? Nobody needs to tell a male that he was created to be a man. Not when the glory of the Lord is here. And I don't have to tell a young girl that you were created to be a woman. Right? And I want you attracted to the opposite sex. I don't care how cute she is. Y'all all right? Because all of this goes back to dust. When I come to church, I come to hear a word from God. Listen, time is out. You don't want anybody lying to you. We don't, listen, go to the hookah bar if you want somebody lying to you. You so high, you don't know they lying, right? <laughs> oh, this makes me so happy. <laughs> but when I come to church, put a demand on the pulpit. This is what we require. Wash us with the word. Tell us the truth. It's not going to feel good, but if it brings transformation, if it brings healing, if it brings deliverance, by God, preach the gospel to us. That's what we want.